Well, David, welcome to London, and I uh, hope that you're getting a good view of London. The uh, Intersec, of course, is just down, down the road, which is the big uh, information security event. But i um, just like to touch a bit on, on your career, your background, because I, I note that you are the first CSO or CISO to be appointed at Tanium, which after, after all is a security company. So it's quite interesting. Um, and what, what motivated that, do you think? Yeah, so you know, I've had a very uh, unique career in that I started out in IT operations and transitioned into consulting. And so I've been doing consulting for about the last 15 years or so, starting at PricewaterhouseCoopers, where I was advising companies on how to develop a, secure, a security program and uh, doing things like penetration testing, mm -hmm. um, an ethical hacker. I was a pretty terrible ethical hacker, but yet I was very successful in, in the role that I played in breaking into companies to test their security. And in 2009, decided that uh, I wanted to go beyond just helping organizations to build their security programs uh, and testing their security programs and um, joined a, a company called Mandy uh, very early on. Fire. FireEye. That's FireEye. correct. They were acquired yeah. by FireEye about uh, five years after that. So right. I spent six years there responding to um, over 100 incidents. Uh, some These of were actual breaches. Actual were breaches. Some mm -hmm. of them very public right? Um, and some of them not so public. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, probably more so, I'd say the greater part of those 100 or so investigations were never made public because most of them dealt with things like Chinese nation state or Russian threat actors. Uh, so things that typically aren't reported. And I responded to those breaches in the U.S., in the U.K., uh, in Denmark, and the Netherlands, mm. uh, all around the world. Very international. Yeah, so it was very, very interesting for me. It gave me a unique perspective, really, on what causes breach. And for me, uh, it wasn't the advanced or sophisticated techniques that I saw consistently throughout mm. my career. Mm. It was very mm. basic mm. issues like patching and configuration management. Basic hygiene, and you, you blogged about that. That's right, quite yeah. Interesting. And and it's not like tools haven't existed to address these problems for a while, but I think what's changed in the industry over the last decade or so is the size and speed of organizations is quickly changing. We have the cloud, we have IoT, we have so many new devices and technologies that it's hard to keep pace. And so, uh, you know, when I, when I left FireEye, I was looking for a company that wasn't providing sort of an iterative mm -hmm. new technology, mm -hmm. but something that was completely and radically different from anything I had seen. And really what I found at Tanium was this communications architecture they had built allows us to do things that were never before possible. To be able to pull back information on a network in seconds, then that changes the game in terms of being able to start to address some of these common issues that I saw in all these incidents in terms of patching and configuration management and threat detection and response. That speed and the ability to scale with today's organizations made all the difference. So how does it work? <laughs> it's quite simple, actually, um, but behind the scenes, it's a little complex. Uh, the organization spent, our founders spent uh, almost seven years really perfecting the technology. Uh, the way everything's worked for the past 20 or so years has been that you have a piece of software that you deploy to an endpoint, and that software then communicates with a server, so client and server communications, and that hasn't changed much. Mm. And the issue with that is as we have more and more devices and more uh, dispersed networks, uh, geographically dispersed networks, it becomes harder to scale that model. And so what you have is you start to have tens or hundreds of servers that you need to locate on your premises to communicate with these uh, agents. And the speed in which you can interact with those agents is fairly limited. So you look at some scanning technologies like vulnerability scanning can take mm -hmm. weeks to complete. Mm -hmm. And even a simple query about patch status, we have customers that are telling us it takes days or weeks to complete that as well. So Issues like WannaCry, for example, if you sure. have that on a, mm. you, you receive that news on a Friday, you want to simply be able to find out which systems are impacted, fix them, and move on. You don't want to spend all weekend dealing sure, with that. Sure. And so our technology really radically changes that client server model and allows um, endpoints to actually talk to one another. Um, we have very powerful computers nowadays. So that's the difference. That is the main the, difference. The endpoints actually talking to each other in the old ring. That's right. Yeah, some people compare it to token rings. Some yeah, people I was thinking it to of that. Peer to peer. Yeah, it's a little bit of both of those mm -hmm. technologies and how it operates. Um, but basically, the server will send out communications in a secure manner, and then the clients will distribute that information, collect the required data, and send it back to the server. And so, 
Um, that allows everything to move uh, extremely quick. And what we can do is for something like WannaCry, and our customers did this, um, they can quickly ask you a question and say, tell me every system that hasn't had this patch applied mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. has SMB v1, which is the affected protocol, mm -hmm. uh, enabled, and we can get those results back in seconds, which is uh, just a complete difference from how IT and security operations is, have um, functioned over the last 20 years. So it seems to have moved from a hub and spoke type of configuration into one, as you say, which is much more of a, a ring. That's right, and there's and lots uh, of advantages to that architecture as well, and we've seen retail and banking and others who have very geographically diverse networks really enjoy our technology because we, uh, although we heavily utilize uh, local area network traffic, it's very light on the WAN since we're aggregating all that between the hosts instead of the client and server. So mm -hmm. we've dramatically reduced uh, the impact on WAN networks uh, through this technology. Yes, so that, that, that's important, isn't it? Um, and um, what you were saying was that even in 2009, when you were at, um, um, at the Firebike uh, company, that you were actually getting a lot of nation state type of penetration and attacks. Yeah, 2009, yeah, 2009 and 2010 is when I started to see um, the Chinese in particular really? um, yeah. attacking US and European companies, mm -hmm. primarily focused around in intellectual property theft. Industrial espionage. Yeah, so yeah. It, it was everything from defense contractors mm -hmm. all the way down to uh, companies that were producing healthcare equipment or mm -hmm. chemical formulas, really anything that um, the U.S. or the European community had perfected as an industry. And it wasn't necessarily stealing the intellectual property to go and recreate it, but to really understand how industries operate so that they could then build these same industries in China. And we see today they have uh, you know, industries like um, the uh, airline, they, they have, um, they're creating new airliners, for example, oh, yes. and passenger yes, yes, airliners, yes. which uh, for a developing country to create it that quickly is, mm. is unheard of. Mm. Um, they have stealth technology, one of only three in the world to yep. have that. So uh, they've definitely progressed very quickly uh, based on uh, some of the theft of that intellectual property. Yeah. And PwC, was that a good training ground for you? PwC was an excellent training ground. Um, we consulted on a ver variety of different areas, um, including security program development and how it Basically learning, it helped me to learn how security organizations function. And then it also taught me the basics around security by breaking into systems, mm -hmm. right? It really mm -hmm. prepared me for responding to breaches because mm -hmm. I had a hacker's mindset. And despite not being a very good hacker, um, it was quite easy to find misconfigurations or vulnerabilities that hadn't been patched that allowed us to break in. So even someone like myself who wasn't the world's best hacker or an excellent hacker, could still utilize very basic and publicly available tools to break into some of, of not only US government, but also commercial organizations fairly easily. Typically, it took me about a week or two tops. Mm. Yeah. So it's amazing how vulnerable a lot of these organizations are. Absolutely. I think most organizations have some understanding how vulnerable they are. And I, I think in uh, at my time at Tanium, we typically engage with customers to what we call a proof of concept, where we allow them to try out our technology. Mm. And mm. we see once they try out our technology in a production environment, it's very rare that they don't want to buy it. And because what they start to understand and see is that they have issues with some of these basic principles. So mm. um, most organizations do, don't understand how many assets they have. And that is very similar to when I was a consultant. I would walk into an organization and ask them, how many systems do you have? How many endpoints do you manage? And I would get varied ranges. Um, you know, between 80 and 90,000 systems. Mm. The worst mm. I ever heard was somewhere between 400 and 550,000 endpoints, right? So there's huge discrepancies and you can't really protect uh, what you don't know about. Uh, exactly, I think the analogy you drew was with a house with the windows, wasn't it? Yeah, You yeah. don't know how many windows <laughs> you've got. Exactly, <laughs> right? So even in, in the military, right, intelligence is, is a huge component, understanding where your enemy is, but also understanding where your troops are what your supply is like, mm. what your capability mm. is. Mm. And if you don't understand that, you can't develop a successful IT or security strategy to move forward. You're really just guessing on what's mm. wrong with the organization. You don't know what the as is is. <laughs> exactly, right, you're guessing. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I noticed also on, on the website that you talk about IT operations and the ability to use this uh, in, in IT operations and obviously asset management, et cetera. Could you expand on that a bit? That's, yeah, that's quite a, I can, you know, as an old CIO, I can, <laughs> I can see potential benefits in that. Absolutely. So 
What's amazing to me is the impact that IT has on security that they don't always realize, I think. Um, if you look at something like asset management, which typically falls under uh, the IT operations organization. And it's a big pain. <laughs> it's a big pain. Uh, I, I go to every t conference I speak at and I talk about something like asset management. Mm -hmm. I'll ask mm -hmm. who here is happy with their asset management mm -hmm. solution today or program today and no one raises their hand uh, because everyone realizes they're missing a large number of systems and a lot of that has to do with the scanning technologies that exist today whereas for the last 20 years we've used uh, a scanning technology that's gone out and tried to search our networks and find things that we don't know about and the challenge today is we have wireless networks, we have cloud-based networks, mm, mm. we have networks that are being stood up and ripped down. So mm. it's a very dynamic environment, and scanning and a dynamic environment don't go well together. Sure. Because I can certainly scan a network today, uh, but it may be completely different tomorrow. So if you're taking weeks to scan a network, it's, mm. it's not a very accurate. And that's what people are looking for, isn't it? I mean, part of the advantage of the cloud is, is having that mobility, flexibility, that flexibility, flexibility yeah. et cetera. Yeah, you can spin things mm. up on demand to take advantage of uh, cost savings, mm. right? Mm. Uh, and performance, and, and not having to maintain that infrastructure to get that performance. So uh, for us, it's been, um, our customers are very excited about the fact to be able to identify things in real time without scanning. So every mm. Tanium agent mm. becomes sort of a neighborhood watch, looking around it for uh, other assets that aren't managed by Tanium, right. and reporting that back centrally. Uh, so for the first time, our customers have a real-time picture of what systems are managed right. and what systems are not managed. A couple of questions there. One, one on BYOD, bring your own device. Mm -hmm. um, how does it help in, in that context? Does, uh, does it help there? Then sure. I, you know, Tanium has been used in a number of different ways. We can secure any endpoint. So you don't have to join a system to the domain. You don't have to have a system that's on your network. It can be anywhere in the world. Right. And as long as it has that Tanium agent, you can manage or monitor um, both for IT operations side. You can do things like asset management, configuration management, patching. Um, but you can also do things from a security monitoring perspective doing detection and response too. And another one uh, is really supply chain because when, uh, when you start looking at the, uh, the whole chain, then uh, part of the issue is, is uh, that supply chain that you're dealing with, your customers, your suppliers, et cetera. Um, how does it help in that context? Uh, so mm. we, um, y you'll notice, uh, for example, NIST Cybersecurity Framework has just added you know, a, a lot of controls and guidance around how to deal with third parties as it relates to supply chain. And then we also saw a report come out from PwC called Cloud Hopper, which talked about a nation state threat that has been using um, oh, yes. third parties mm. to attack their victims. So they may have you may as a company may have secured your environment, but yet your third party provider who has access to your environment may now be compromised. And so that's something I saw a lot of over the years as organizations get better, attackers find different ways and then third parties are often that, uh, that way. Um, where we've done a lot with customers is during the acquisition process or partnerships where organizations are connecting networks together. They'll deploy our agent and be able to quickly determine not only from an IT and operations perspective where the cost savings lie with things like licenses mm -hmm. or overlap with different types of software, um, but also from a security perspective to understand exactly what exists uh, in terms of defense, but also in terms of what risks exist there. It could be a configuration risk. It could be that an attacker is on the network. So a lot of our customers are now using that to assess other networks that are then connected to them or okay. requiring right. some of those third parties mm -hmm. to also mm -hmm. use something like Tanium to get real-time reporting to d determine their risk in terms of missing patches or errant configurations. Sure, sure. Um, so, um, you've obviously had a fantastic career coming, coming through this. Um, and I know you had a, a blog on talking about the, the potential for, for youngsters coming in. Can you tell us a bit more about the, your views on that and what, what advice you can give to the young ones coming into the, sure. the profession? You know, I, I was very lucky that in high school I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And, mm. and I think in part that's because of my father. He's a guidance counselor. Oh, right. So I think he always instilled a very good sense of direction in, mm. in, my, mm. in, uh, in, in me. Um, I would say there's a huge opportunity in cybersecurity. Um, we, there's every company I talk to has a limited set of qualified staff. They could always use more. And in fact, in the, the last three jobs that I've held as a hiring manager, 
I've never had enough people to mm. fill the slots. Mm. Uh, in mm. fact, if you went to the Tanium website today, you'd see we just constantly have open racks for people with security experience, cybersecurity experience. Um, there's a couple of different ways I've seen this play out. Uh, one is obviously going to school, getting a degree, getting experience in this. A lot of it too has to do with um, just experimentation. Um, universities do a great job of preparing you on the basics and the foundations, mm -hmm. but getting used to technologies and installing technologies and playing with them and just researching them is a really great way to get started. And there's tons of resources out there on the internet today that deal with security. Um, but I think organizations are the ones that are really suffering right now. Mm -hmm. There's two ways to go about it. You can try and hire experienced people, or you can try and hire and groom college graduates. And I'm much more supporter of the latter method because you get to develop someone um, with your culture in mind. And so I've had a lot of experience of su success with hiring individuals that um, ha are very smart, intelligent, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and driven individuals. They're very passionate about the subject. And with those basic qualities, you can really turn them into experts in nearly anything. Um, one of the individuals I, I, I hired in one of my previous jobs to run t as uh, we were starting a new office, and he was the first hire in a new office, and he had absolutely no cybersecurity experience. He, um, he was a nuclear engineer, and he graduated from Berkeley with mm -hmm. a master's degree in nuclear engineering. Bit of technical knowledge. Very technical, <laughs> very smart individual, but he was very passionate, he was intelligent, and he took the initiative on his own to learn a lot of these things, and he became an excellent, not only an incident response, but today he's a developer. So he works with me here at Tanium today, He's uh, one of the individuals that are, uh, participate in our endpoint detection response team and is responsible for helping with the development of our products and developing new content for our customers. And so those are the types of people that uh, organizations should be looking for to augment the shortage mm -hmm. of skilled and experienced individuals. And you tend to develop more loyalty in those individuals sure. too if you bring them into your organization mm -hmm. and invest with mm -hmm. the training. And the training, that, that's getting the professional qualifications like CIS and, and so on, is that necessary? Certainly, I think certifications are important. The government sector tends to weigh certifications more heavily. Mm. The private sector, not so much. So if you mm. look at a, a lot of the private sector, they're simply looking for whether or not you have the experience. Right. Uh, so the certifications don't matter quite as much, I think. Um, there are certifications that are test-based. There are some mm. that are more based around um, actual use cases, actually making you do things like um, hack into certain things or, or, or program certain things. Uh, I tend to think those are the more valuable, whether actually having you walk through and test your knowledge of applying or applying your mm -hmm. knowledge, mm -hmm. as opposed to those that are just memorization or test taking. So I think over time, uh, the certifications will improve, but experience, I think, will always be the driving factor in hiring, especially sure. in the private sector. Sure. I'm a great experience, great exponent of learning on the job. <laughs> um, you've talked a little bit in your blogs on a couple of subjects, and one of those in particular I find quite interesting, which is around the health industry. And uh, you had some points, I think, to make on uh, issues within the health industry, and perhaps later I'll come to the UK health industry. But I think your, your points there were really more general, weren't they? Yeah. When you were talking about that. Yeah, so that the, the health industry as a whole has many challenges. Um, first, I'd say the health industry hadn't really been targeted too greatly um, over the last decade or so. Typically, you'd see banks or defense contractors being targeted by some of our more the more advanced adversaries or adversaries in general. But that's changed over the last several. That's years. That's the security companies, is it that you're talking about there? Well, I'd I'd say. Um, health care companies or hospitals, mm. those and that. I th I'd say they're being more heavily targeted by attackers nowadays. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah. So, so that wasn't always the case. Right. Right. It wasn't right. always the case. In fact, uh, you know, I remember thinking about, you know, what would a Chinese nation state or some of the more advanced threat actors really want with a sure. hospital, for example. Sure. Um, but that's really changed uh, yeah. for a couple of reasons. One is um, hospitals have demonstrated that Obviously, they have life-saving equipment, and mm. uh, they need to be operational, and so they're mm. more likely to pay some of these ransomware. So it's the advent of ransomware, the ramping up of ransomware. Of and, and the other, I presume, is around health identity. It is. It is. As yeah. credit card information has been harder to get and is not not is not worth as much money, yeah, uh, P, yeah. you know, PHI becomes yeah. a much more valuable mm. 
uh, set of data for mm -hmm. attackers to collect. Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing is this shift for both unsophisticated and more sophisticated attackers gravitating towards organizations like hospitals and health insurers because they have very sensitive information that mm. can be monetized mm, mm. and can potentially also be used for cyber espionage as well. Sure. So advice to the health sector, because you had a, a very you know, good blog on that, I thought, yeah. giving advice. So, uh, you know, there's, um, there's not much great advice I can <laughs> give. They, they have a shortage of money. They have a shortage of people, which puts them at, at a significant And that's in the States as well. Is Absolutely it? in the States. I think really? that's globally from that industry in, as a whole tends to um, not view security uh, with the same scrutiny, I think, yep. as other industries. And I, that's slowly changing. Uh, so my wife is a doctor, so I certainly understand uh, right. <laughs> the component of uh, having easy access to information in a timely manner because um, these organizations, you know, in the emergency room, for example, you're providing life-saving services. And so it's very difficult to go and enter a password, right? Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to go and bring up a screen that may take a while mm -hmm. to load mm -hmm. or have any issues with a computer, mm -hmm. right? That mm -hmm. can impact. If there's time pressure, etc. Absolutely, that can impact someone's so. life. So sure. the balance between those is I'm always going to err towards the side of saving a life as mm -hmm. opposed to implementing security. Mm -hmm. So that's another huge challenge, right? So mm -hmm. lack of money, mm -hmm. lack of people, and then you have this very big uh, challenge where you have to balance the ease of use with security. Yeah. And so what I, I think hospitals need to sort of pivot is developing an architecture um, that takes these into account mm. and start to modernize their systems. Mm. I see mm. a lot of the pain and suffering in hospitals tends to do, and, and this is true for every organization, legacy systems mm. tend to implement a lot of, introduce a lot of pain and suffering because they're difficult to patch. They don't have the same security features. Um, they're difficult to use. Mm. Um, mm. So as hospitals modernize, I think that will be a big driver towards uh, alleviating some of this. The, the second is network segmentation. A lot of these devices don't need to be connected to the internet. Mm. You, I could compare them to ICS or critical systems that you might see in the oil and gas industry, right? Mm. They're not things mm. that need to be necessarily connected to the internet. And so segmenting these devices off so we don't have to worry about things like WannaCry, for example, mm. so they're not accessible via the network will make a huge difference as, as well. Um, but won't we lose some of the benefits then about um, having that information if, if we segment them? Some the things need to be connected, but a heart machine, for example, or... Doesn't it need to be? Not necessarily need to be connected, or it doesn't require the ability to be connected to. It may need to send some data outbound. Yeah, so if you're doing predictive an analytics on a mm -hmm. machine, then that would need to send that information out, but not... Right, and so if you look at something like WannaCry, for example, yep. we have all yep. these outdated devices, these legacy devices that yep. can't be updated in many cases. Yeah. But yeah. if they were segmented so that uh, an infected system couldn't talk to it, mm. it would have avoided catastrophe in some cases. So yes. I think that's thinking about things from an architecture perspective and segmenting systems and limiting access to systems, some of the most basic foundational mm. controls and information mm. security, right, mm. um, need to be better applied to some of these devices. Do you think we're taking uh, an architectural enough view on, on the I don't think networks? so. No. No, no, I don't think so. I, don't, I, I think that uh, it's very difficult to create a, a secure architecture because of all the older technologies that exist today. And especially so in the health sector. Especially yeah. in the health sector. Mm. So what most organizations that have been successful making that transition, what I see them do is really go and create a brand new mm. um, environment, mm. brand new state, where they wall off some of the old legacy equipment mm. and they start to modernize by building and designing something new that meets all their requirements and slowly migrating the functionality from the old network to the new network. Because it's very hard to do that uh, at the same time, mm. or just simply retiring old systems and replacing them with modern ones. But mm. having a clear vision and a place you want to go and understanding that I need to understand um, the state of all my endpoints. I need to be able to do that quickly. I need to be able to patch within a certain period of time. Mm. I need to be able to control access to systems. Having those basic foundational components um, is, is something that we need to start planning for now. Um, and there's plenty of opportunities to do that. So you look at the NIST cybersecurity framework or any security frameworks, those are what organizations should be using to build the basic foundation of their cybersecurity strategy moving forward. And just looking at, um, at the UK and the UK's NHS, I think you had a few, a few comments there. I mean, there was a big attempt 
way back in uh, the noughties to actually get a, a cohesion more in secondary care than in primary care. Primary care does seem to have gone ahead in the UK and actually got itself reasonably well automated. Um, but I think in secondary care, there was something called the National Programme for IT. Um, and one could almost say they were trying to eat the whole elephant in one go. <laughs> um, and it's had partial success, um, but also it's got itself a bad reputation. So I think they're working against that. But what would your advice be in, in, in the UK and the NHS? Yeah, I mean, one, one of the challenges I see in a lot of organizations, they try to do too much at once, right? And yeah. Talking about that transition in architecture both before by sort of taking small chunks. Right. That's really a, a better strategy because what, what I find is if you try and do too much at once, it really never gets done. You try right. and make it too perfect and you never really achieve it. Well, it was a huge do. project and uh, I think the stakeholder management could have been better. <laughs> Dealing so with the, you know, the medical fraternity isn't easy, <laughs> but... I, I think um, mm. also the other advice I would give is that um, I'm very impressed with the UK government, um, what they've done with the cybersecurity strategy here mm -hmm. in the UK. And in fact, the, the government here in the UK has provided, I think, better advice and support than we've seen in the US from our own government. Oh, really? Right. Um, and in large part, that has been through the formation of um, NCSC. Mm -hmm. and That's fairly new, though. It's fairly new, yeah. Mm. but. A lot of the individuals responsible for forming that over the years have been building some of the foundational components that have gone into that. Yes, there have been elements of government who have looked after security and those have been pulled together. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so today we have the UK Cyber Essentials, which mm -hmm. touch on, touches on a lot of these hygiene related issues. Mm -hmm. And then the UK Cyber Security Strategy is fantastic in that it's actually fixing some of the flaws that we have, not only with the internet, but with email, some of the connective technologies that really connect all the different organizations here in the UK and globally. Um, so I see a, a, you know, a lot of effort from the government, uh, especially through NCSC, trying to change a lot of these habits. And mm, so mm. I, I think engaging with them is a very great way to better understand uh, how to mature or how to expedite your information security program. It's, it's a very big um, animal to <laughs> It, tame, it is, but I think they're on the right track with starting with the basics. and they right. They've been really preaching uh, about things like patching and configuration management and access management, which I really think is a great message that resonates, that will resonate well um, and help to, I think, offset some of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that's introduced by a lot of the vendors speak, which talk more about zero-day threats and mm. things that are well beyond mm. A lot of the areas that you know, especially in healthcare, mm. that they're, they're mm. challenged with at the mm. moment. Right? Well, Forget yeah. about zero day attacks. <laughs> we need to figure Hatching. out how we're going to patch our <laughs> systems, right? Yeah, um, some of that stuff was pretty old. Yeah, I mean, um, WannaCry mm. is a great example of hygiene mm. if you look at it, mm. right? So, mm. WannaCry could have been prevented four different ways, mm. right? So, you could have patched four different ways. Four different, different ways. You could have patched your systems within the sixty days that were available before WannaCry was released, and that would have prevented it. You could have uh, prevented communications between SMB, which is the Windows protocol, SMB v1, which is the Windows mm -hmm. protocol that allows for sharing uh, yep. data across systems. Yep. Most times, you don't need a system to talk to another system to do that, and um, especially over the internet, which was mm -hmm. the case here. So you could have blocked that, which is already mm -hmm. a best practice. Um, you could have also have upgraded to a newer version of SMB. SMB v1 is almost 30 years old. Mm -hmm. It's an old protocol. It's, it's quite interesting. Uh, you, you're talking, uh, I think, in, on the website and in some of the blogs about the UK um, probably being your next market of interest. Um, is there any reason for that? Is, is, it, uh, is there something in particular that you see in the UK market? Uh, mm. First off, the size and complexity of organizations in the UK, I think, is on a similar scale to many of those in the US. Mm -hmm. um, the market here is, is pretty significant, right? And some of the biggest organizations in the world are headquartered here. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that's, that's one reason. The second is, I view the UK as having a very progressive view on cybersecurity. Ah, okay. uh, with a lot of the actions the UK government mm -hmm. has taken, uh, I consider the UK now to be a leader in cybersecurity in the world. It's today. quite interesting, the public sector, everybody decries it, but actually in IT, it's done some good things. Uh, setting in standards for project management, program management, uh, ITIL on service management, um, and BA and TOGAF 
on the architectural side. So, Absolutely. you know, it, it has set some standards in there. And now, I think, in, in security as well. I think you're, I think you're right there. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at other regions of the world, like Asia, there's a big gap to mm. where, between where the UK is and, and where Asia is. And, mm. and there's a lot of research to support that. Yes, yes. Um, big one coming up, and everybody's sort of starting to get geared up. They've, they've realized that uh, May 25th, 9th, uh, 2018 is not very far away. And the initials GDPR are now starting to you know, come into people's line of vision. Um, Tanium and GDPR, how, how do you see that? Yeah, so I'm thing? very fortunate that Tanium is an on-prem solution. So right. Uh, our customers install it, maintain it. Uh, they may put it, install it in the cloud, but we as a company don't have any access to the Tanium installation, and we're not maintaining any of those companies, their, their data, which makes it very easy for us to comply with GDPR. But mm. it also enables our customers to comply with GDPR. That's, that's what I was interested in. Yeah, yeah. so sure. the ability to control your data at your own location or location of your choosing makes the Tanium solution very attractive to organizations who have to satisfy GDPR as mm. opposed to uh, a lot of our competitors that have opted to build their solutions in the cloud besides being extremely expensive to maintain for them, which is why um, many of them are having challenges or mo all of them, as far as I'm concerned, aren't cash flow positive like Tanium is. Mm. It also makes it much more difficult and now that day they have to actually silo data or at least understand where European data sits mm. so that they can potentially protect it better according mm. to the standards mm. or delete it. Uh, mm. there's, a, there's this concept of the user Erasure. has the right to be forgotten. And mm. so that ability is fairly difficult to have when you have data, European data mixed with other regions in the world. And mm. so I think we're going to see a lot of challenges for some of the big cloud providers. Um, and it's definitely going to be a challenge for smart. And of course, that's another change, of course, is that the cloud providers now have the responsibility as data processors because the responsibility is now increased for the data processors. Absolutely, and that's, that's going to change how they operate in their business model, and it's going to increase costs for them. So yeah. as consumers, we'll likely see some increased costs because of that. Um, but certainly for, for Tanium, it's a huge competitive advantage to offer a solution that allows our customers to control their data to meet their specific GDPR mm. needs. Because I think that's one of the big issues if organizations historically have not looked at their personally identifiable mm -hmm. uh, data, uh, then that, that's, that's going to create big problems. And the DPA was a little looser, the Data Protection Act was a little looser. So going into something as, as um, strong, I think, as GDPR is going to create a problem. Yeah. Um, but I think it's an opportunity because uh, you know, data governance, a number of organizations I go into where data governance is good is zero. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I think it'll help a lot of organizations start to better understand where their data exists today, yep. better secure it, yep. uh, and make for a more streamlined uh, processing of that data. So there will be some good, I think, that comes out of it. I think we will see a lot of organizations realize an increased cost because of this. Mm. Certainly security companies will do well, and law firms will do well because of oh this. Yes. this. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of how well it'll be enforced or, mm. or how it'll be enforced mm. at all. Um, so that'll be an interesting to see how, how it plays out next year. I think there are quite a few enforcement agencies who are waiting for the <laughs> 25th of May. Okay, well, David, thanks very much for being so open and uh, instructive and informative. Thank really you. About everything. Uh, you've got InfoSec down the road. I don't know if you're going to go down to Olympia at all, but you've got a whole lot of information security people. Down I, have, I have some good friends I will be catching up with, and, right. and certainly we have a, a number of customers we're going to be meeting with this week, so I'm very excited. Great, because I, I think you know, the information security area is one that's uh, growing and growing. Oh, absolutely. Not least with people trying to get into our systems. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks very much. Indeed. Thank you.